Hey everyone, it's John. So I'm coming back with a new video and this thing is, this is gonna be different than the last one. So today I'm looking at a book actually, a book that I recently finished. It's called Icons of Christ, A Biblical and Systematic Theology for Women's Ordination. So <clears throat> um, as you can tell, it's a, uh, it's, it's a case for women's ordination, which is um, obviously a controversial issue right now. Um, just for some preliminaries of where I'm on in this, I think, you know, I grew up in a non-denominational charismatic church and charismatics are pretty, you know, egalitarian in the sense that, um, you know, they're all basically, you know, the, the basic hermeneutic is that, um, uh, the Holy Spirit gives people gifts and the Holy Spirit falls on, you know, everyone, men and women alike, and gives them gifts, you know, as, as God sees fit. Right. And, uh, the, the, the passage here, let me, let me just pull this up because I think this is a, a really, a really important, uh, part of it. So, um, let's see, should be Acts two. Yeah, so Acts 2, um, this is Peter addressing the crowd, you know, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So the idea there is pretty clear, that's sort of the, 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 um, you know, the key, the key text for Pentecostals and Charismatics which is, you know, that's sort of the attitude I grew up with, you know, if the spirit is, is, you know, descending on men and women alike, why couldn't, why couldn't women preach as well as men? Why couldn't women, you know, prophesy as well as men? Why couldn't women exercise, you know, and the, the idea is, yes, they can, they can exercise these spiritual gifts um, in the same way. So that's, that's my background where I'm coming from, um, which is to say that, um, in an evangelical and particularly charismatic context, I think I've always been in favor of, of, uh, you know, women's ordination, which, you know, in charismatic context, that just means women's practicing the spiritual gifts that, um, that, uh, you know, God has given us. Now, outside of the charismatic and evangelical context, things widen out a little bit in terms of the responsibilities and uh, certain actions that a woman, a, a woman in uh, in an ordained position would perform, which is, you know, again, that's what this book is trying to address. Uh, a much wider perspective it doesn't really talk about the charismatic side at all, which is interesting. Um, so, but uh, it it basically what I'm going to do to sort of step through this is I took a bunch of notes on it, and I'm going to step through these notes and sort of point out interesting things as I see fit. Um, and then after that, what I'll do is I have a sort of short review response article that comes from the, um, you know, the, that comes from a position against women's ordination. So let me just share my screen and get this set up. <clears throat> All right. So there's, there's two, there's basically two sides. There's, there's two ways to attack this this argument. Um, there's the more Protestant side of things, which is, would basically, that's, you know, maybe more accurately called low church. He calls it Protestant. So that's your, your complementarian type arguments, your Wayne Grudem arguments, those sort of things that are generally rely on exegesis and, um, and have a particular focus on the authority of men over women in in these certain ecclesiological domains. The second argument is more focused on the Catholic side of things, um, but Catholic is not Roman Catholic. It's in a broader sense, which includes the Roman Catholics, which includes the Orthodox, which includes, you know, high church Anglicans and Lutherans, the more high church sacramental side of things. And that specifically deals with the Eucharist and the administration of the sacraments. So just off the bat, I think this approach is interesting because I'm, because I grew up in this low church Protestant world, I'm much more familiar with the sort of biblical exegetical arguments for it, you know, sort of 
you know, what on earth does Paul mean when he says, you know, kephale, head, stuff like that um, in these certain passages. So to get the, the, the side that I was interested in because of my development as a more high church sacramental Christian, the side of that, this is more interesting to me is because I was already sort of decided on the low church, you know, Protestant evangelical argument, you know, in favor of women's ordination. The interesting question to me is, well, can women, are, are women able to administer the Eucharist? Is that a proper thing for a, for a, a woman to be able to do um, in an ordained position? Which I think, because I've come to the conclusion that the Eucharist is the most, you know, it's the center of the entire church service. It should be the most important thing because that's when we're receiving Christ himself. So it really matters how we're doing it, you know, that we're not, you know, receiving it improperly as Paul talks about. So that was sort of my, um, you know, basic take going into it. I was, I was sort of on, on the fence in terms of the high church side of things. Can women administer the sacraments, the Eucharist? Um, and so, yeah, we'll see that. I think this this book helped me definitely push my opinion more towards the fact that, you know, women can do this. And there's not necessarily a woman, there's not a reason to bar them from this sort of exercise of office. So um, to set up some preliminaries here to finally get through these uh, these notes here, uh, the there's a, a couple of modern positions floating around that, uh, you know, either against or in favor of women's ordination. And the key point that um, he makes the author is Will Will Witt, by the way, is the name of the author. So the the argument that Witt makes, the, the key point that he, he puts out at the outset is that none of these existing modern arguments are the traditional arguments. So he says the argument from tradition is not the traditional argument, is his take. So, and, and the reason he, he says this is because, um, um, we'll get into this more as, as it goes, but uh, basically the, the, the ontological perspective on women has, has shifted dramatically. And the new positions, whether they are the, you know, complementarian position, the, the uh, traditional Catholic, you know, not traditional because of the argument he's making, but the Catholic argument against women's ordination and the egalitarian pro women's ordination argument that wit is advancing all of these arguments arise out of modernity in response to the new conditions and new uh, perspectives on the ontological nature of women um so basically the you know what he says here is there's there's a new theology of women's equality that did not previously exist and so for that reason opponents and you know by extension the um the uh, uh, proponents, but more importantly, opponents of women's ordination have had to develop new theological rationales in order to oppose it. Um, and and to, to note here, the, the positions, be, you know, the, pro, the broad Protestant and the broad Catholic positions are different. So like, you know, complementarian Protestants who are pretty low, you know, low church on the Eucharist um, would probably, you know, who believe that lay people could do it would probably not have a problem with a woman doing that because it's not as central of a focus. The focus for them is more on authority. Whereas for, um, I said complementarian Catholics, but complementarian is strictly a Protestant term, evangelical term, you know, that was basically invented in the 80s to be clear on that. But the shorthand gets kind of <laughs> difficult here. Uh, and ca the point is that Catholics would not have a problem uh, with a woman preaching or teaching like compliment, like Protestant complementarians do. And so that's sort of the interesting divergence that we see here. The Protestants and the Catholic opponents of women's ordination oppose it for very different reasons because the function of the presbyter or the minister or the priest is much different in these two um, contexts. <clears throat> so the, the first, again, before he actually gets into the theological arguments, he talks about the non-theological arguments. So, um, you know, there's the, the the sort of political atmosphere that we're involved in is very relevant to this, and understandably so. Like, um, one of the arguments that 
people will make is that the ordination of women is liberal theology. It's connected to this uh, liberal secularist agenda introduced by liberal theologians. And there's a very slippery slope going from women's ordination to ordaining gays or marrying gays or um, ordaining transgenders or, you know, transgender people, whatever it is. So um, the, the point that Witt makes here is that just because advocates of women's ordination were theological liberals does not imply an inherent connection with um, with women's ordination to theological liberalism. And uh, the the notes that I would make, the note that I would make there is, um, you know, regardless of what liberal theologians or, you know, whoever says today, if women's ordination was practiced by the early church, if we can derive it pretty clearly by the New Testament, these non-theological arguments disappear pretty quickly. Uh, you know, if we're going to be faithful to the, the Bible, and we're going to be faithful to the early Christian tradition. That seems pretty clear. Um, so then there's a slippery slope argument um, that um, the, the women's ordination inevitably leads to the collapse of orthodoxy, which is what we've seen in the mainline churches. And that whole, that whole process has started with the ordination of women, um, you know, decades ago in the 20th century in the mainline churches. So um, the the, the argument that Witt poses here is that the problem is not the sex of the people holding the theology, but the theology itself. And the better question to ask is, should as ordination of theologically orthodox women, so, you know, theologically conservative, whatever, whatever label you put on that, has that been a blessing or a curse for the church? Because it's unfair to um, uh, equate women who believe in historic Christian orthodoxy as theological liberals, if they're in favor, you know, if they are ordained or if they're in favor of that. Um, the argument from rights here. So that that's basically saying, look, we're in this rights-based culture right now. You know, the, the gay people want a right to marry, the transgender want a right to transition. The women de are demanding a right to be ordained, right? Um, so, Obviously, no one has a right to be ordained. This is sort of this um, individualist rights frameworks that's very modern. It's not found, you know, in thorough Christian tradition if we go back. Um, but the point that Witt makes is that this rights argument applies to men, too. And the question is not whether, you know, about whether women are demanding rights. It's whether the church should refuse ordination to one particular people group um, as a class, just because they belong to that class. So that's that's the question that he'll um, uh, uh, sort of uh, play out here. Um, so the, the note that I would add is, um, to go back to the slippery slope argument, which I think is connected to the argument from right, um, my own note here is, look at the Assemblies of God Church, um, the classical Pentecostal groups, they've been ordaining women in the modern era, if you want to just talk about modern women ordination, which is fine, they've been ordaining women in the modern era for over 100 years. They are theologically conservative and orthodox by all accounts. You know, they're going to have, you know, they're low church, they're evangelicals, they're charismatic. So they're going to have the um, the uh, the certain particular religious, you know, particular beliefs of those groups and particular practices of those groups. But um they're still, you know, lowercase o orthodox as far as I can tell, right? They've been ordaining women for over a century, um, you know, the charismatic tradition since its origins over a century ago. And Azusa Street has had a long tradition of ordaining women. And again, the reason that I had a question for this is because the Eucharist didn't really matter in charismatic or, uh, ordinations. The sacraments didn't really matter. But that to me is a, you know, it's again, it's only 100 years out of 2000 years of church's history so things could change and i you know i don't want to close the door on that but so far they've had a a pretty darn good track record <laughs> on that front so that's just something to um to to know about so you know the last the last sort of non-theological argument the the church rightly discriminates against certain classes of people in our nation such as unbelievers um, children shouldn't be ordained. Um, practicing homosexuals shouldn't be ordained in, you know, again, Orthodox churches. Why are women different? 
Um, and so the, the uh, argument that Wynn makes here is that in these cases, the barrier to ordination is not against a class per se, but against a, uh, a defect or an attribute of an individual that prevents them from properly exercising those duties. So an unbeliever could become a Christian, a, uh, a children, a child could grow into adults, you know, et cetera, that sort of thing. Um, the, the prohibition against women is again, per se on the basis of their class as women. Um, so the point being that the, you know, the argument that we, sh we can discriminate against all these other groups, including women does not hold in Witt's view because the, you know, designating women as this, as this, as this, uh, as this class is not the same thing as we're, when we're talking about unbelievers or children, where that, that class can actually change over time, whereas it can't with women. Um, so it's going to take me a long time if I go through all this step by step. So um, we'll see how I process this as I, as I go along, but I might, I might decide to skip things as, as time, uh, as time sort of uh, goes on. So as I mentioned before, here's, this is his point. The argument from tradition is not the traditional argument. So the background here is that a tradition is only as good as the reasons behind the tradition. Um, the same tradition done for different reasons is not the same tradition, but an entirely new one. Um, and so this is an interesting argument. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I mean, there's, this is something he talks about near the end of the book, but how do you incorporate, um, how do you incorporate changes in society or the outside world into your pre-existing structure, right? And the argument he's going to make here is that they've, that the opponents of women's ordination on the Protestant and the Catholic side have invented new reasons to oppose it that are not commensurate with the, um, you know, the traditional reasons. And for that reason, it is an entirely new tradition, which is an interesting argument. Um, you know, I'm, I guess it's not entirely clear to me that if the reasons for supporting a tradition shift, that the tradition itself is different. Um, like the analogy he uses is um, the analogy he uses is is say you have a a you know uh, you know a mother teaching a daughter to break to to bake bread and you know the the tradition that they had that um, the mother was passed down from her mother was that oh you 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 cut off the the you know you cut off the the end of the loaf um, you know. At, you know, before you actually eat it and, you know, throw it away because, oh, that's the, that's what my mother taught me to do. That's what her mother taught me to do. So that's how we do it. Um, it doesn't seem to make sense. So, <laughs> um, but what, what the, the analogy goes is that the, you know, the mother goes back to, to, to her mother who goes back to her mother, who is now very old and says, well, the reason we did that in the first place is because we were poor and we had this really small pan that wouldn't fit an entire normal sized loaf of bread. So we always had to cut off the end. And so now this is sort of revealed. The reason for the tradition has shifted. You know, previously it was like, well, this is something we've done because my mother taught me to do it. And this is something that, you know, we, we, we have just always done as a family. Um, whereas now the, the, the reason if, if the mother and the daughter were to choose to maintain that tradition of cutting off the end of the loaf of bread, they would be, the Witt's argument is that they would be inventing a new tradition um, because they're no longer doing it just because it was passed down from, you know, uh, you know, mother to daughter, but that they're knowing, knowing what they do, that this is, this is essentially a functional thing more than anything else. Maintaining that would be a new tradition because it's based on different reasons. So I think maybe, uh, Maybe go. Maybe that's enough for that, <laughs> because this this next part I think is is getting to the more interesting part of it, um, which is and this is like this to me was one of the most central points of the whole book. So I think it's important to 
it's really important to note, um, and it was interesting to me to to hear about this because I hadn't thought of this before. And that is that the 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 single argument um, used in the church against women's ordination um, traditionally before the modern arguments was because they had some inherent ontological defect. You know, they were, you know, women were less intelligent. They were um, more emotionally insta uh, unstable. They were more prone to sin in certain ways, you know, the wayward woman, whatever, that's, that's the Bible. It's not the early church, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I think you, you know what I mean? So, um, and what he does is he quotes, he pulls quotes from, uh, several, you know, uh, church fathers and Christian thinkers throughout history. So Origen, Tertullian, uh, uh, John Chrysostom, Albert the Great, Aquinas, Hooker, Knox. So all of these guys have, uh, wit his pope, Quotes from all these guys sort of laying out this this um, this idea, and the the you know the key thing is that these historic claims that were used for opposition to women's ordination have all disappeared in modern denominations, um, which now recognize the equality, the essential equality of women um, intellectually and morally. Um, and so, like, if you if you if you listen to, to complementarians in particular, the first thing that they say is like, "Look, we think women and men are have the same ontological status. They are equal before God. They are both equal divine image bearers." You know, they are really at pains to say that, and because they recognize this this point, because throughout church history, many you know, most of the, it seems like the majority of thinkers have in fact. Um, embrace this idea is that no women are not ontologically equal with men um because of x reasons <clears throat> so um the because for that reason the the because both catholics and you know everyone recognizes this the the new catholic and the new protestant positions against women's ordination are theologically um new arguments and what Wood would say is by they are entirely new traditions because they are they are basing this on entirely different arguments. Um, so uh, the the interesting part of this to me is I think I think I accept this argument. I find it pretty convincing. Um, what's hard to do is like, you know, would we see more evidence for this claim? And anything I like highlighted in this in this review, this is my own personal note. This was not something in my book. These are just thoughts that come into my into my head as I'm reading. Um, what I wonder is how universal is, is the, is, is this claim that, that Witt is making about, about the ontological, you know, the view of the ontological status of women. Now, I think I'm, I'm pretty convinced that it is. I think it's reasonable, but it's sort of like, because this, this claim that Witt is making is so central to the, to the rest of the argument, um, it bears a lot of evidence to say this was actually the fact. And I would have liked to see him give more evidence, I think. Um, like he, again, he lists several quotes sort of giving you the gist of it. And I guess the idea is you could, you could look this up and, you know, find this in basically every uh, pre-modern theologian who, who, who wrote about this issue. Um, so I think, I think that's, I think it's probably true, but I think it would be important for, especially for the, the, the Catholic argument against women's ordination to really just, here's a comprehensive list. Here they are. Here are your foremost theological figures. You fundamentally disagree with them on the nature of women, okay? So, <laughs> so the point is your theological argument is not in concert with their theological argument, and therefore your theological argument is a modern invention, and it is not traditional, um, which is very important for um, Catholics, of course. <clears throat> so the new Catholic position um, is basically the it. Th there's a couple of angles they take with it. So one of the angles is you know apostolic succession is important, and so the new position is has something to do with Christ choosing twelve only male apostles, and that that's a significant argument that's advanced in Catholic circles. Um, another one is the 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 the, ne the necessity for the priest to physically resemble Christ, and so what that would mean is because 
because the priest is representing Christ, the uh, the priest should be male because the priest should have a physical resemblance to um, to the actual to to Christ Himself, right? And so that would preclude females from participating in that. Um, so this Witt's, Witt's response to this just briefly is this is an appeal to tradition. It's not a theological argument. In fact, the tradition is is much different. It's not really the tradition, right? As we said before. <clears throat> um, and there's no way to get from an intellectual capacity that indicates an inequality to uh, that that demonstrates an inability to uh, teach and lead. And he lists a few sources that um, advance this sort of argument. Um, to now then and intellectual and ontological equality that allows teaching and leadership, but not celebration of the sacraments. And he gets into this further, so I'll leave it there. Um, new Protestant position, most people are more familiar with this, I feel like complementarianism, equal in being distinct in roles. That's the gist of it. Um, and I think what, what popped out to me for the first time is how indicative this is of the sacred secular post enlightenment split in the sense that um, the interesting thing about the complementarian position is they will allow and 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 Witt quotes Wayne Grudem on this. Grudem is like the the sort of the, the central figure in complementarianism about what Grudem lists that that women can and can't do, the roles that they can't perform, right? And one of the like one of the examples is women can teach the Bible at a secular college, but not as a, at a at a religious college. So it's really strange. It's a really strange position. It's like, what? So so we're all about women not having authority over men. They can have authority in this context, but not in this context. Like, what's going on there? And I think one, one interesting root of that, this is not something Witt talks about, but this is something I thought about, is um, the secular sacred split that takes place in modernity post-enlightenment, right? Uh, before this, Grudem would not have been, you know, 400 years ago, this is not an argument Grudem could have made because there was no, I mean, it was starting to emerge, but there was really no sacred secular split until, you know, post-Reformation into the Enlightenment. They were all, you know, the, the, there was no even concept of this separation, right? You know, every everything was sacred to an extent. Um, and so you, you there was no reason to, there, there was no wiggle room to, set up the roles in the way that the complementarians are setting them up. So I thought that was an interesting point. Again, that there is a disconnect from tradition. It would be obviously a disconnect from the biblical New Testament context, which is what complementarians um, care about the most. Um, the, the, second, the second part of the complementarian argument is this, this Christological argument they make of subordinationism. So um, basically the there, there's an al analogy between the son's subordination to the father and the wife's subordination to the husband. And um, Witt is going to interrogate this um, subordinationist Christology a little bit more um, that um, complementarians seem to have sort of, you know, invented out of whole cloth or just pulled out of nowhere. It's, it's just hard. So let's see. Um, Yeah, I might try to, to, to go quickly through this. Um, so the, again, just to point out a contrast between the, the complementarians and the Catholics here, uh, the, comp the, the, the contrast is, is very distinct. So um, because it's about authority. So if you read Theology of the Body, uh, John Paul II actually takes a very egalitarian position when it comes to marriage. I'm um, looking at the relevant texts, you know, Genesis 1 through 3, Galatians 3, 28, Ephesians 5. And the quote that Witt puts in here from John Paul II is, all the reasons in favor of the subjection of women to man in marriage must be understood in the sense of a mutual subjection of both. So that's the like the mutual submission. There's texts that Paul, uh, you know, some text from Paul that talk about that. Um, so that's that's the fundamental hermeneutic that JP2 is using, which is totally against what Grudem is using, is that this is a, a uh, you know, a top-down sort of one-directional submission in terms of authority. Um, and again, because, because JP2 sets this out, for Catholics, women can now perform all of the tasks which complementarianism prohibits. So of course, a 
a woman could teach, um, you know, Bible, they could, she could to teach on the Bible at a Catholic college, right? That's something Catholics would allow. That's uh, a Protestant would not allow a woman to teach Bible at a, you know, religious Protestant institution, for example. <clears throat> um, let's go with that. Um, so, so Genesis one is always an interesting part. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna say I'm gonna try to go through this faster. We'll see if it pans out because. The, I think the biblical arguments people tend to be more familiar with, at least because of the way that I grew up with, the actual exegetical text-based Protestant arguments people are more familiar with um, because there's a few texts and people just try to tear them apart in different directions. Um, but the, 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 I will lay out the, the point in Genesis here because I think it does, the talking about Genesis is also more relevant to the Catholic position than maybe trying to you know, exegete all the little possible interpretations of uh, of like the Pauline corpus, let's say, because Genesis is like fundamental and sets everything out. Not that Paul isn't as important for us, but <clears throat> so um, one thing Witt sets out: there's no gender roles as such because men and women are equally tasked with being fruitful and having stewardship over the earth. There's nothing pre-fall to indicate. Um, hierarchy or gender specific roles between the two and we see this because in Genesis 2 the translation of Adam which is the man in 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 your English translations is the human being which is admittedly more clunky but it's grammatically male not biologically male and so um, sexuality here is not introduced into the text until the creation of woman as such um, sexuality is reality does not exist in this initial stage because there are no there are no men without women and this is this is an interesting point that's going to recur a bit is men are only men by virtue of the existence of women and you know vice versa for women um, so the 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 argument that one of the big arguments that Witt is going to make is that the fundamental category here we should be looking at is not male and female, it is human. And male and female are sort of subordinate to the ultimate category, which is human. And, you know, the implications there may be pretty obvious that it's human beings who should be ordained, not men and not women, right? Um, so we'll get to that. Um, um, the word azer, I think maybe some of you are familiar with it, if you ever listen to Bible Project or whoever. Um, this is what's translated in in Genesis 2 as helper, the better translation is companion corresponding to, or because this, or even like, you know, essential partner or something like that. Um, because this same word is used of, uh, of, of, you know, there's no connotation of inferiority here because God is the azer to Israel in, in some of the Psalms, right? So helper, again, it's, it's, you know, a lot, a lot of the problems that we're going to see in these, in these textual arguments is translation problems, <laughs> right? Um, you know, English translations, you know, especially the ESV comes to mind is translating them with a specific, more complementarian bias. Um, again, as I noted, some of these translations are clunkier, of course. <clears throat> um, so one, one point I brought up, so, so Whit makes points out that it doesn't say that women, the, the woman leaves her parents to cling to the husband, but the other way around. And what my thought was, doesn't the fact that just the man does this and not the woman indicate some ontological difference between them? That That's sort of my my note. I didn't support that with any argument. I actually, I, I don't think it's the case. I think I would have to go through and prove it. And I'm not super convinced of my point either way now that I you know, looking back on it a little while after making that. So um, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> but uh, so um, subordinate in Genesis 3, then we have subordination is first mentioned specifically as a consequence of the fall. And I think this is another important point is that when you look at the Genesis narrative, the subordinationism and the hierarchical stuff and all of that only comes into play after the fall when the curse has been established, right? And as Christians, the curse is the 
fundamental thing that we are tasked with reversing to the degree that we can, right? Christ uh, reversed the curse in an ultimate in an ultimate sense by conquering death, um, and we can only we can only reverse the cor the curse, you know, so far as that goes, because um, uh, you know we're obviously finite, fallible humans, and we're not going to see the full realization of the curse being reversed until uh, Christ returns. But um, this is, I think, maybe the fundamental task for the church. And I'm not trying to advance like a, a you know, certain post-millennial eschatology in that or anything. But I'm just noting that this is what we should be doing. We should not be, we should not be happy with the status quo when the status quo is is fallen and sinful and when it's in contradiction with what Christ taught us. Um, so the the point that the the note that I made in Genesis with in this point with Genesis 3 here is that he doesn't deal with the the very obvious text of the woman eating of the tree first and giving it to the man, which I thought was a strange omission because not because that is a contradiction to his argument necessarily, but because um because opponents of women's ordination will lean on that text quite a bit. I'm pretty sure the the early, the, you know, the, the fathers lean on that on that specific text quite a bit um, to to indicate that, you know, the woman by her nature is more deceptive than the, um, uh, you know, is more deceptive, more prone to sin, more whatever. This this is a text they would appeal to, right? Um, and so it would be it would be useful to, you know, maybe spend a few paragraphs of of interpretation there to just figure out what exactly is going on. I think that would have bolstered Witt's argument here. Um, so Grudem lays out a few arguments for male headship pre-fall, and uh, you know, basically the gist of it is that they're not very good. Um, the you know, sort of listening to Grudem here, at least at least how Witt quotes him and uses him. Uh, Grudem is not a very good <laughs> interpreter of the Bible, frankly. It doesn't seem to me. It seems like he's he. Uh, is pretty, oops, what did I do here? Um, it seems like he's pretty, uh, yeah, just not very good at it. I don't know how else to say it. Um, I never, even even without Witt's argument against him, whenever I would read Gruden's interpretation, I would just be like, dude, what are you talking about? This is not, this is not convincing. This doesn't make sense. So um, I'll leave that there. Um, so women in the Old Testament, um, is another topic that's part of this. Um, so, Witt's point here is that the old the OT recognizes the subordination of women to men because that was the case in the broader ancient Near Eastern culture. Um, but at the same time, the Old Testament doesn't justify it in any way by um, pointing to female inferiority or considering it of divine origin, which is unlike the the ancient Near Eastern religions. Um, so in that sense, the Old Testament is different and it represents what um, uh, what might be called a uh, a redemptive movement hermeneutic by this guy, uh, William Webb, who has authored another uh, egalitarian argument for a book on the egalitarian argument. Um, and then the 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 important here, you know, another another angle that Witt takes here is the the changes from a pre-industrial society to the post-industrial one and the, the the changes in women's roles and how the in ancient times in ancient Israel the socio socioeconomic reality was that the household was the basic unit of production so only women could bear and nurse children um and uh that was an that reality has since shifted over time and I think Witt is not trying to say that that's necessarily a good thing I think he's just making an observation of what has historically happened. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, Christological subversion. This is this is interesting. So um, the idea here is that Christ subverts all of the expectations of the world and the people around him, right? And he he subverts the you, you can just see this in the cross, right? He, he subverts the, the entire notion of worldly monarchy by being crowned as, a, as, as the, the victim of victims on, on this cross, on this you know, instrument of torture. And that is, that is his throne, right? The cross is, is 
he's enthroned on that. So the idea there, there's a there's a massive reversal or subversion of everything that the world expects of all of the the um, you know the ideas that the world has of of what a king should be, of what a messiah should be. Um, and so Witt plays this out sort of in the in the in how Christ relates to his disciples and um, you know this this honor culture, this honor shame culture is 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 another part of it that. <clears throat> um, uh, in ancient societies, honor and shame was very important, and Jesus sort of turns this on his head. He doesn't totally he doesn't totally abolish the the good and the ethic that's behind that, but he totally turns this on his head. So, um, family um, in the honor culture. So, family was very important, of course. You know, you would uh, you know you could kill if your if your if one of your family members was you know violated or had an injustice done upon them for whatever reason. Um, Jesus creates a what what what's called a fictive kinship um, created by designating God as Father. So when we when God is designated as Father, that means all of us believers are brothers and sisters in Christ, right? All of us are His children, and so that kinship is developed that did not exist in the in the ancient um, biological families. So. On the state level, the messianic but subversive triumphal entry. So, right, Jesus doesn't just go in there and and overthrow the government, right? He makes a a completely subversive statement against it and saying, you know, when he rides in on this donkey, right? Um, you know, Jesus before Pilate and John, Jesus does not um just does not abolish and overthrow Pilate's authority. He says, Yes, you have authority, but it was only given you know, basically from me or from the father that, and, and it's, you're the only reason that you're in, I'm the only reason that you're in this position, basically. Um, honor, you know, challenging the honor culture in terms of, you know, radical for forgiveness, going the extra mile and subverting boundaries in, you know, clean, unclean, insider, outsiders, all of the boundaries that Jesus subverts in the Jewish honor system. Um, there's a few points about Jesus and women that basically play this out. Like, basically, Jesus didn't, you know, acted in a much different way towards women than we would have expected from the average ancient Near Eastern culture. He didn't see them as second-class citizens. He uplifted them in many ways. Um, there is subordination of the sun. So he must have mentioned this um, in this context. So... One one problem I, I I have with his argument against um, the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father is that um, he doesn't appeal he doesn't deal with any of the texts that complementarians would use to support that because again complementarians are Bible people right they are going to try to pull texts from the Bible to support all of their assertions which I think is a noble goal um, but what they're going to miss or, you know, what, what Wit is maybe whisk, missing here is that subordinationism for the complementarians is not just an abstract argument that they derive from some, you know, random theologian. It's something that they claim they can derive straight from the, from, you know, straight from the texts. Um, and so support, you know, again, supporters of that idea would point out verses that, um, you know, uh, you know, verses in the Gospel of John, for instance, that, you um, seem to support that Jesus is in some sense eternally under the authority of his father. And they would, and, you know, therefore it's a valid metaphor for, for, you know, men to women or Christ in the church and whatever. So, um, yeah, Witt doesn't deal with any of the relevant texts there. And maybe, maybe it's just because he's pressed for space. I mean, the book is already 350 some pages as it is, but I think it would have been useful to um, more persuade complementarians um you know against this position um because they wouldn't see it as just some speculative position that came out of nowhere like i said this is something that they can pull out in the biblical text and if you know i'm you know it's very easy to look these things up because of course i i'm i'm not listing any the, the specific biblical texts are not coming to mind here but um you, you can see this in in a lot of complementarian arguments that you look up so Mutual submission. So um, 
like the complementarian arguments are, you know, primarily from Paul and headship and the complementarians interpret headship as something like unilateral authority or hierarchy or something like that. And Witt is going to make the argument later on that this is not correct. Um, but Witt also says that the, the master story for Paul's, um, for Paul's arguments and Paul's spirituality is cruciform and it's canonic. Jesus emptied himself. He, it's not that as Lord, he lords it over us, but he submitted himself to us. He condescended to us um, in order to redeem us. And so, um, you know, with, with that with that sort of perspective in mind, Wit is setting up this framework. Well, look, this is how Paul looks at it as, as a mutual submissive, uh, canonic love. If we're going to follow the, the subversive example of Christ, this is how it should look like. And this is the key that we should use in interpreting those sort of trickier passages that the complementarians will use to indicate um, a, a woman's necessary submission to a man in authority. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, so anyways, he goes through um, Ephesians 5 a little bit, different interpretations of that, household codes. Um, again, revolutionary subordination, this, this relates to what we talked about earlier, um, where Paul challenges and transforms the household cold values of the day. Um, so I think, yeah, I think what I'm going to do for this is, uh, as you can tell, I'm sort of doing this on the fly. <laughs> but I think what I'm going to do is um, sort of skim the rest of these biblical arguments. I think these are ones that people are more familiar with. So um, they're important, no doubt. I take the Bible seriously. I think it's a primary source of, of our faith and, and how we should think about this issue. Um, but I think the, the, the most interesting argument to me is on the symbolic side of things, which I was just waiting for somebody to make a symbolic argument, um, about, you know, what, what the nature of women, of men and women are, what are their symbolic, you know, all, all of this stuff. So it gets more interesting in my opinion. So let me just go through here. So he basically steps through the, um, the uh, you know, the egalitarian, um, you know, the egalitarian arguments, the complementarian objections to those arguments, and, you know, the egalitarian responses to those arguments on, on in the Pauline corpus. And I think what I'll do is I'll link this, this Google Doc in, um, in the video description. And if you want to take a look at it and, you know, take a deeper look at it and, and sort of get the gist of it without actually having to read the book, it'll be there. Um, I will say I didn't do this uh, totally comprehensive. So um, there, there are things that I, like it's not quite here, you can see this section here is just empty <laughs> because it was like, okay, I've sort of had enough of, of taking notes on it, I'll just read because it was, it's not that the arguments are totally uninteresting, it's just that they're less interesting to me because you know, I've heard them a lot, and I also have this idea of biblical interpretation where you can't, there's no objective monarchical view from above that is necessarily right when you're talking about biblical hermeneutics. I think that is um, epistemological nonsense, basically. And, you know, the reasons for that I could talk about elsewhere. But to move on to perhaps the more interesting Catholic arguments, so I'll keep this one brief. Um, the idea that an ordained woman would be a priestess is, you know, misleading and what Witt would argue is is demeaning because, um, you know, it's it's a red herring that's really not associated there. You know, a priest is a priest, whether that priest is a man or a woman is is basically the idea of it. Um, you know, the, the connection of the ancient, you know, of priestesses to the ancient sex cults in Israel neighbors is is tenuous and, and you know, doesn't really exist. Um, uh, that's that's the sort of argument that these these sex cults in Israel's neighbors that everybody assumes exist didn't really exist, and so this argument for priestesses being outside um, corruptions of the nation of Israel are uh, you know basically bad arguments. Um, so why in Israel then in ancient Israel were there only male priests? So the reason that wit 
the wit argues for this is first the socioeconomic reality. Only women give birth and nurture the children. So in that sense, their biology restricts them to household roles, which is you know not the case for men. Um, you know, secondly, um, priesthood was not just restrictive on the basis of, of of gender. You had to be a Levite of the tribe of Aaron to be a priest, right? So it's not that 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 gender is like some fundamental barrier here that to the exclusion of other barriers, because there were other barriers existing. Um, now, this this is the most interesting point to me, is that the the pre-existing purity laws would have presented, this is a practical argument. The purity laws would have prevented a woman from performing temple duties on a regular basis, right? Because, I mean, you think about menstruation, she's going to be unclean for, um, you know, several days a month. You know, post-childbirth, there's a period of uncleanliness there. Um, so not only were they prohibited from actual priestly duties, but just getting too close to the actual area of sacrifice itself, you know, to getting into that more holy, uh, that more holy space um, within the temple structure. And I think this is an important point because, you know, this this to me is a great explanation of why there were no female priests in, in the Old Testament, because ritual purity was so important. And it's not the it's not the ontological status of, of women that they are somehow ontologically um, inferior. It is that, well, there's just these practical realities of, of a woman's biology that would preclude her from performing these duties and also, um, and even being in the sacred space, not just performing the duties and also, um, uh, you know, being clean and pure at the same time in the ritual sense. Um, so the reason this changes in the New Testament church is because purity and holiness turns more into a moral and behavioral sense instead of a ritual sense as it was in the Old Testament. Um, because we see Gentiles admitted into the church, um, we see the, um, what comes to be the irrelevance of physical sacrifice and the uh, the physical temple. Um, and rather than being made unclean himself, Jesus made the unclean clean. That is so cool and so important, right? That the, the previous ritual uncleanliness that restricted women before is gone because Jesus has made everyone ritually, morally, behaviorally clean. Um, it's not that Jesus is 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 corrupted and made unclean when he touches the the woman with the hemorrhage, but he makes her clean, and that is that is a really cool um, insight and an argument I think about um, you know the you know that's that's just a cool observation about the nature of Christ's work I think and and what he's done for us and it's really profound, and the implications for women's ordination in the church and the New Testament I think uh, you know start becoming pretty obvious. Um, so the, uh, the new Catholic argument that, um, Witt talks about is how the priest functions in persona Christi, Latin, taking on the role of Christ when he pronounces the words of consecration and only a male can represent Christ in this way because Christ is physically a male. And so the physical is important to the sacramental. So we need a right sacramental representation of Christ. Um, and the note I made here is um, what Witt will do is post Christ as human or Christ is representing humanity first over and above Christ as male. And if we adopt that logic, that is, you know, this is a Protestant sticking point for me. This is the same reason that makes the high role of Mary unnecessary because Christ will fulfill the entire human mediation intercession role, not just the the male one, right? I think, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit with Catholics and Orthodox about this Mariology point, and this this is maybe an implicit argument, and what they say, I think, is that there's, there's something that Christ does that is somehow not enough in the sense, not maybe not that Christ doesn't do enough, but that we we can't sufficiently relate to God through Christ in himself. Um, I'm going to say these things and they sound, you know, that sounds like a pretty terrible theology. And so I don't want to like automatically impugn Catholics and Orthodox with that sort of thing. But 
But, you know, I mean, what reason would there be for having Mary and, and positing Mariology um, in this sort of thing? So the idea here is that if, if we if we adopt this prior of Christ is human before Christ is male, this um, this would connect us to both women's ordination and a, you know, quote unquote, low Mariology um, in the sense that, you know, Mary does not have the heavy intersectionary or the uh, mediation role that, um, you know, Catholics and Orthodox would ascribe to her. Um, so, the, the argument that, that Witt makes here is that, again, this is not the traditional argument for Catholics because um, there's no New Testament or patristic evidence for the idea that the priest was to act in persona Christi in administering the Eucharist. Um, and because of that, since Christ is male, only a male can play this representative role. Um, Witt makes the argument that it's, it's only sourced in the medieval sacramental theology of the Western church. And specifically Aquinas, and Aquinas himself doesn't even explicitly say this. It's sort of the interpolations after Aquinas using him that uh, bring this out. And this is something that, you know, you could have a whole PhD thesis or dissertation on playing out the evidence here, which is one of the reasons I noted. So again, if you're a couple, if you're a Catholic um, opponent to women's ordination, you're going to want um, you're going to want a little more. Uh, uh, you know, a little, a little more here, I think. <laughs> Let's say that. Um, so the other thing Witt notes is interesting is there's a division between East and West with respect to the Eucharistic consecration. So does the priest act as a representative of Christ when the exact words of institution are read, which is the West, the Catholic, Roman Catholic position? Or is it that the Holy Spirit, um, is the Holy Spirit the agent of consecration when the epiclesis is invoked, which is the the, the words to invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit, um, which is something that the East um, deals more with? And then considers the words of consecration more of a historical account of what Jesus said instead of being key to the actual consecration. Um, I think I'm going to take a break here and uh, pause this and come back. Uh, <laughs> uh, good to maybe just uh, rest my brain a little bit and collect my thoughts for some more coherence. All right. So what I decided to do is basically just skip to the stuff that's interesting to me. I think. This is getting, ah, it's getting kind of long and rambly as it is. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. And just the stuff that is, came out as most salient to me. And um, I think it will hopefully be mo most interesting to, you know, everybody watching. So um, one argument that Witt brings up, and this is, this is now in the, in the more symbolic side of things that the 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 sort of the, the the take the gist of it is that the 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 symbolism of male and female that those ideas of of basically male men's being more expansiveness and active and females being more receptive and passive and and that sort of thing um and and the um the the, the the sexually bifurcated male female um, dichotomy with this in the symbolism, um, the argument that Wynn makes is that this entered Jewish Christian thought and Christian thought post Alexander, um, and it's ultimately from Greek thought is is his argument. Um, so here here then is like he lists a few texts that do that, uh, a few of the the intertestamental texts, uh, the Mishnah, the Talmud, which has these 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 views on women that seem stronger against the um you know as compared to you know their statements about women and their uh, you know ontological inferiority are are you know maybe more clear than anything that you could make an argument from the old testament i think is you know that's the basic idea of it which is interesting so basically what Witt is doing is blaming the male-female symbolic bifurcation on 
and importation from Greek thought. And I don't think he's totally doing this. I think he recognizes that there is sexual symbolism, um, you know, throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. But what he's arguing is specifically this, this, um, this very bifurcated, polarized view that posits male versus female as fundamental categories. I think that is what he's saying is from Greek, is from, um, you know, the Greek tradition and is not really something that you would have found in the Bible. So there's... <laughs> This, this is maybe, I think, the, for me, the most problematic part of the symbolic argument for me. Um, it seems like a, a very dangerous argument to make because Christianity has deeply incorporated um, not Greek thought per se, maybe, but more Greek language and Greek categories into, you know, many other areas like Christology. And so... I'm not convinced that you can just throw out the symbolism on these grounds alone, that just because it, you know, oh, well, it's Greek, it's not biblical, basically, which also ignores the amount of Greek influence that the New Testament has, which is, you know, I think undeniable, you know, you know, Christ being the logos. I mean, that's, that is not, not something that you could have gotten per se from the the Hebrew Bible using that language, right? That's something that I think is obviously using a Greek structure and which I don't have a problem with. I mean, I think Christ, Christ incorporates and redeems, you know, all of human thought that is in accordance with the truth that no matter where it comes from, whether it comes from ancient Israelite culture, whether it comes from ancient Greek culture, whatever it is. The other thing is, and this, this is, this is a broader point. Um, the authority of the father's tradition. And this is something I've wrestled with a lot because I've had, I've, I've grown to appreciate the patristics and the tradition of the church much more as a more sacramental, um, liturgically minded Christian. And the problem is I seem to clearly disagree with them on this particular issue. Now, of course, as we've talked about, the reasons for that disagreement have changed very much. Um, because, you know, even if I disagree with the fathers on this issue, I mean, this, this ontological defect argument is obviously wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think there's any, 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 you know, modern evidence that would bear out the, you know, this argument being actually true. I, <laughs> like, ob obviously, women can be as, as, you know, and in general, are as smart as men, obviously, um, you know, there's no, there's, there's certainly, there's absolutely male and female attributes that you can attribute to male and females as, you know, tendencies, let's say, as a group one way or the other. So obviously, you know, women are more neurotic, um, men are more aggressive, that sort of thing. But, you know, when we're talking about ordination, we're talking about individuals, right? We're not talking about them as a group. And so, it should come down to the, you know, is this individual man or woman suited for the job? It's not that they are discriminated against solely against the basis of their class. That's sort of the way I would look at it. Um, <clears throat> but the, the broader question of it, which has much wider implications, is, okay, let's say we depart from the fathers on this issue because everybody is, really. <laughs> We're not continuing the tradition of women are ontologically inferior to men that, the, that most of the fathers held. So then the question is, how much departure do the fathers need to make from the New Testament to make tradition discontinuous, right? The argument that especially the Catholics would make, but I would, I would make this argument too, is that there's a continuity of tradition from apostolic times, from, from Christ himself, all the way to the present. If this, if there's a discontinuity on this one issue, what implications does that have for everything else? Like, can we, can we reasonably hold that? Oh yeah, the fathers were wrong on this issue. We're going to ignore them on this issue, but we're going to take as a given because of tradition, these other issues that they talked about. And that is a very tricky thing that I have to think about more because um, you know, having a proper respect from tradition means being very careful when 
you come out and take the opposite position that tradition has seemed to help. So yeah, I'll leave it there. And the general note about this is all of this symbolic discussion is deeply fascinating to me. I would love to see because, because Jonathan Peugeot and you know his brother Matthew Peugeot in his book introduced me to this symbolic thing. I would like to see what they say about it. What would Peugeot say? Would he make symbolic arguments in the same way that Wit is making here? Would they look different? You know, what does I, you know, my my assumption is is Peugeot is um, you know, would be against women's ordination, which would be understandable. But, you know, what what are the symbolic arguments that he that he would make for that? Would Wit's arguments rebuff those? <clears throat> so let's see here. Um So in this section here, there's the point of this section is playing out the the transcendent and the imminent and the male and the female, how those two categories interact, how they sort of play out, and what what is the proper notion of thinking of those categories in light of the incarnation, in light of Trinitarian theology, in light of you know Orthodox Christology. Um, and so this is really interesting because the, what, what Witt is doing here is basically breaking down the, not breaking down the categories, but he's reframing the categories in such a way that the binary contrast is not fundamental, um, between male and female, that the human is what's fundamental. And so, um, Witt responds to this, uh, this German theologian, uh, Hauk, Hawk, I, I don't know however you pronounce that, um, whose argument is, is traditional against women's ordination. And on the symbolic level, this is how it illustrates it. He says, the transcendent of the male proceeds like this. We have God, um, then to Christ, and then to the priest. So that's sort of the transcendent male end, end of things on the symbolism side. The second, the other side of that is the imminent female side, where we have um, creation, you know, so God creation, Mary, Christ Mary, um, and then, you know, the church and the laity. So priests above church and laity. So God, God expands and acts and creation is created. It, it, it receives, so to speak. Um, you know, Christ is, is, is active and he, he, as a male, he, is, is active and expansive, and Mary is this more passive and, and receptive. Um, and then, of course, we have the priest who who is who is active, who pro who projects to the congregation as a representative of Christ, and you know, and the church and the laity receive that they are receptive. And so that's the symbolic argument. And the obvious implication of that is that because if if the priest is to follow this symbolic topology, he would be male. He would have to be male. Because of this this notion of expansion and and projecting and I'm giving you this and projecting myself you know through word and sacrament to the congregation. So um, basically, Wit sort of deconstructs this and maybe deconstruct this. I don't mean to sound postmodern, but uh, Wit argues against this. Let's say, and I came to be very convinced by his line of argument because. Um, What Wit adopts is a relational ontology based on the Trinity, is, is basically it, right? It is, it is only in relation to others that we can return to our self to achieve self-possession. So the, 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 the point is setting up this bifurcation between male and female is a disjoint, right? It's, it's not setting up relationality and, um, and uh, sub subsisting in others as the as the fundamental mode of being, which is contradictory to what we would say about the nature of the Trinity, that the nature of the Trinity is fundamentally relational and each of the persons subsisting within the other person, so to speak. So this is this is the the I thou relationship. Um and and he draws on on Bart here to um, um uh, play this out a little bit. So the creation of humanity in the image of God as male and female echoes Trinitarian relations. 
to be human means to be inherently oriented towards relation towards other persons as grounded in the inherent relationality of sexes. So again, there is no male without female. There is no female without male. There is no God the Father without God the Son. There is no God the Son without God the Father. There is no relationality between those two without the Holy Spirit, that sort of thing. Um, so the point here is this Trinitarian personalism that uh, Witt is laying out is uh, rebuke, you know, says that this, this symbolism that we talked about here is a false contrast. Um, because it's inter, it's it's not separation between transcendent and immanent. It's interrelationality. They are um, they are fundamentally, what would you say, dependent on each other. I mean, how can the transcendent be transcendent if there is nothing with respect to be transcended to, right? So um, let's see. Um, to be is to be substance in relation. All reality possesses both an in itself and towards the other dimension. Substantiality and relationality are primordial and necessary because God is three persons in one nature, and all creatures manifest this dyadic being in which in being in being reflections of God, who is their capital S source. So to me, this is this is an interesting shift because I'm pretty left-brained. I'm I tend to think of in the more object realm, objective realm, instead of the relational, what would you say, subjective realm. And thinking of God as Trinity is just to say that the cosmos is fundamental, like in being, the entire existence is fundamentally relational. And you could go the other way. You could say, well, being is relational, therefore God is, is Trinity and all of that. There's an eternal relationship. There's an eternal relation and eternal communion within the nature of God himself. And so that logic, that, that sort of prior logic is very appealing to me because I've written on my blog previously of arguments for the incarnation from a personal sense in that God is most is made most personal and made most relational in the incarnation where Christ descends to our level he becomes more most personal and most relational to us because he becomes a person because he becomes a human being and drawing again um these arguments that Witt is making here, I, I was very happy to read this because it fits so well with um, my intuition about relations and not objects about being fundamental to being, which is a shift in my in my thought about ontology. And, you know, again, my maximally personal argument for the incarnation, you can read about that on my blog if you want. Um, so the the for the present discussion to sort of bring that, um, you know, bring that full circle. Um, the transcendence, imminence, substance, relationality, action, receptivity, dis distinction should not be understood as contrasted between men and women, but rather complementary and dyadic and, and characteristic of all persons. These are simply human and personal characteristics. Uh, Hawke's division makes persons not persons as such as relational beings, but isolated monads. So this is interesting. I think you can have... You know, I just said this argument was very convincing to me, and I think it still is. But you can have the, the, the I think what Witt is pointing out is at the very least how the symbolic argument that he's arguing against is framed as a as a sharp distinction, as a sharp dualism that um you know does not obtain because of this Trinitarian personalism. Now, maybe the you know, the objection from the women's ordination opponents would be like, well, look, we believe that these categories cross over, right? But um, I think at the same time that I find this argument pretty convincing, I would say to Wit that we shouldn't throw out, we shouldn't entirely throw out the nature of masculinity and femininity as symbols and as how to talk about this as as helpful for seeing where these sort of distinctions take place um i'm not making a closed argument for this by any means but and i don't think wit is trying to throw out the distinction between men and, women. and here's why because what he does is bring up this trinitarian account of transcendence and imminence so um 
this this to me is interesting because to the points that I was just raising, wit keeps a wit wit keeps the distinction between transcendent and imminent present, but he what would you say? He brings us this relational ethic to to uh, flesh it out and make it, I think, more convincing to me. So let's see. On the theological side of things, this this distinction that um, Witt is arguing against between transcendent male, eminent female, is missing the significance of the incarnation, the hypostatic union, and the full Chalcedonian definition. So Christ as God is creator and as human is creature. And so this is the perfect meeting place between transcendence and imminence, which I think is, is really good. Like Christ is not just transcendent, guys, okay? Christ is, it is as much imminent as he is transcendent, and that's the logic of the incarnation. And so to just place Christ as totally active and totally expansive without acknowledging the fact that he is also just as much receptive and imminent in that sense that he's taken on that nature is such an important point because we cannot just throw out the incarnation with this with you know let's say misconstrued symbolic thinking and so the the symbolic thinking that wit lays out that i find convincing is goes like this so we have transcendent um by nature neither male or female is god the father because you know wit's argument here is that sexuality is created god is not created right fully transcendent and fully imminent, the incarnate son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen, right? Amen. <laughs> imminent, God, the Holy Spirit, and who is uh, who inhabits the church. With, and the church consists of both men and women. So this is the structure that lays out. I want to see Jonathan Peugeot respond to this. I think this would be so interesting. Um, this, this, this is not like, Peugeot does not seem to quibble over individual theological issues, which is fine because I think he has his own place that he works in. But nonetheless, I would love to see this happen because I would love to see what he makes of this symbolic shift. And if he thinks it's a valid representation of symbolic thought, um, and, you know, Peugeot's opinion would you know, be pretty, pretty uh, significant and weighty. Thing. Um, let's see. So I think that was the most interesting uh, part of that for me. Let's see. I think what, what this gets into, so sort of a Christocentric and Trinitarian account of worship. Um, so um, Torrance, who is a Reformed theologian, argues that the centrality of Christ's vicarious humanity, which is his role as mediator or high priest, the role that he's, you know, when he ascends to the Father and brings all of humanity up to the right hand of the father in himself that idea was lost in the church's worship and uh after the patristic era which um is what torrance calls apollinarianism in the liturgy so um and a consequence of this which is interesting to me is the substitution of other mediators to make up for the loss of humanity in christ this is huge for roles uh you know mariology and roles of the saints so um because if we if we have this complete if we have this complete view of christ which we started with from the beginning and this this you know my argument against mariology basically is like look christ is human we have all that as as we have all that we need humanity has all that we need in the person of christ because he is fully human he fulfilled all these human roles perfectly as God always intended, right? So in that sense, there's no need for these extra roles of Mariology that sort of play on. Wit doesn't talk about Mariology or the saints at all in this, but this is just my sort of additional point. Um, let's skip to the, the gist of it. The ordained presbyter is not a mimic playing a role. He is a delegate speaking to the church on behalf of God as a delegate and responds from the church to God. So this is commun communication and communion, which is both active and receptive, both transcendent and imminent, both male and female. It is an activity which is primarily personal. It is primarily human. It is not primarily gender. Theologically, then, both men and women are able to do this. So that's 
basically the symbolic argument that I maybe laid out a little bit disjointed. But <laughs> let me just talk about why I find this compelling because at risk of repeating myself, I find the intuition that we are fundamentally human. We are first human, not first male or female. I find that immensely persuasive. I, I think, you know, Jordan Peterson says that male and female are perhaps like the two most fundamental categories that we know of on a phenomenological level, let's say. And there's a sense in which I agree with that. But there's another sense which in the underlying category that is even more fundamental than those is, is humanity, right? A united humanity means both male and female. A united humanity means this fully relational, you know, uh, Trinitarian mode of being that is lived out in, in our lives, in the lives of the church. And to me, all of that reason, reasoning makes it compelling to me that women should have the same, what, what would you say, the same access, the same ability to fulfill the kind of roles that men can do because the distinction, the, the, the fundamental principle is not the distinction between men and women, though that is very important to be clear. It's so, it, the, the distinction between men and women is important um, because obviously what we're seeing in modern culture today, the distinction between men and women has totally broken down. And so that's why it's important to, you know, that's, some, that's something we can't emphasize enough, but at the same time, the fundamental, layer of reality is humanity. It's not male or female. I like it. <laughs> I find it convincing. I think it's it's great warrant for, um, you know, symbolic warrant for, you know, going through women's ordination. So the point is like, I'm convinced. I'm, I'm kind of naive at the same time. That's why I would like to see Peugeot respond to it. I would like to see somebody who is a master of symbolic thinking their thoughts on this. Does this does this make sense? So, yeah, there's no chance that Jonathan Peugeot is listening to this, but if he is, I would love to see him make a video on this symbolic argument. <laughs> okay, women in office. So this is the last part. Um, you know, we have stuff like a woman deacon. Phoebe is a, is a deacon. We have, um, um, you know, stuff like that. We have uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla being, you know, having a teaching and ministerial role to Apollos, for example. So there's that, that context there. Um, women's ministry in the New Testament. Um, so the, the, you know, part of the problem here is that neither the complementarians nor the egalitarians have a strong argument from the text as such, because the text tells us so little. What exa what, what was an overseer? What did they do? What was a bishop? What, what the heck were they doing? Presbyters, deacons, you know, who knows? Who knows what these people did? Each of the, you know, the, the tradition, you know, each of the traditional churches have sort of over time developed the these own specific roles for what one of these people did. But when it comes to New Testament office, we have basically next to no idea of what was going on. So that's why it's difficult. Um, so with that in mind, Witt makes this argument that um, uh, that women can be properly be representative in, in New Testament office, and that is a role that they can um, fulfill. And so I think I'll just um, leave it there for now. And I guess that's all of my notes. Okay. What a rash. And I'm getting a little bit um, uh, mentally tired, so I should try to wrap this up. But... Um, one thing I did want to do before we go is go over here. So this is a review, um, you know, by a fellow Anglican. Witt is an Anglican. Um, this this guy who wrote this review is an Anglican. Um, against Witt's argument, and I'll try to link this in the in the description, and you can go through this if you want. Um, but this is not a very comprehensive response, which is fine because like, you know, it's some random article on the internet. I mean, you could see how short it is. So there's there's only so much you can say. But with that said, um, I think 
in today's day and age, it is very difficult not to worry about the slippery slope. That, look, we started ordaining women. So, you know, ordaining gays is next. Ordaining transgenders is next. You know, marrying gays is next, whatever. And, you know, I recognize that concern. I think I think it's important to think about. At the same time, it's it's a political argument. It's not a theological one, which is to say that it's transient. You couldn't have made that argument 200 years ago. You probably won't be able to make that slippery slope argument 200 years from now, right? So for that reason, I mean, look, I get the slippery slope problem. I think I am I am not in favor of, of, you know, ordaining or marrying practicing homosexuals. I'm not in favor of the whole transgender ideology that's, you know, seems to be raging across the Western world right now. I'm not in favor of those things, to be clear. Uh, but if, if we are to decide on this issue, we cannot decide on transient political arguments one way or the other. We can't agree with the feminists and say, look, women have always been oppressed. We need to liberate them. And that includes ordaining them. We can't go to the conservative side to say, look, these, these upstart women are going to, you know, turn our whole church gay basically we need to have um transcultural theological arguments for this sort of thing because that's how important it is so yeah the theological arguments trump the political ones the slippery slope arguments to me i don't see any way around it i mean look if paul approved of of, of, you know, Phoebe and Junia and Priscilla and these women that seem to, as Witt argues, exercise, you know, positions of, you know, ordained specific ministerial roles in the church, with leadership roles even, then that basically is the end of the story for me. <laughs> if this happened in the New Testament, we should be doing it now. And I think that's something that obviously Protestants would agree with that. Um, I think Catholics and Orthodox, if, you know, I think they would agree. They would generally agree with that principle too. So, um, yeah. So that, that. So, anyways, this this guy talks about the slippery slope. Um, the charge of misogyny. Um, so there's some logical fallacy stuff in here that I was not totally convinced about by this this author. Um, that Whit, you know, this author argues that Whit lays out a logical fallacy um, in the syllogistic argument he presents. Um, yeah so the 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 misogyny argument right this is this is i think the idea here is is look we moderns know better than obviously we moderns are better than those ancient pre-modern historical people who were just superstitions and crazy right and that's the argument you can make well obviously women should be ordained because we're modern and we're enlightened and Whatever. I think that is the straw man that this author here is responding to. Um, um, more sophisticated than that. But again, like, again, this is still a slippery slope, you know, fundamentally political, culturally constrained argument, because you couldn't have made this argument two or two or 300 years ago, whereas all of the arguments that Witt is making, you could make two or 300 years ago. So again, I think that's another, you know, sort of non-theological argument that would not hold water in a transcultural sense. Maybe it, what it is an argument for to give to give these arguments their due is let's be careful with this. Let's not just open the floodgates and and maybe let the whole thing in. Like I don't, you know, I think the Catholic Church in the end of things should be ordaining women. I'm not a Catholic though. So at the same time, I recognize that doing the right thing maybe does open the door more in, in, a, in, a, in a culturally bound sense for the wrong things like gay marriage coming into the church, for example. So I, I recognize that concern and I don't want to just wave it away or sound like I'm waving it away. Um, anyways, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> What has happened to make women's ordination seem plausible in our day, even though it was unthinkable to all past ages of the church? And this is a fair question to ask. Um, you know, right here. So there's technology, 
the decon technology like you know contraception, the decondensation of society, family, and work. Um, that a modern approach to the sexes because of these things that sees the sexes in competition for values and positions that are genderless. Now, I think this is this is at least somewhat correct. A somewhat correct criticism you could make of Wit is, look, he doesn't give enough credence to the ideas that men are cut out, men in general are cut out to do certain things. Women in general are cut out to, to do certain things. That doesn't mean we should prevent all men and prevent all women from, you know, we shouldn't prevent all men from being nurses. We shouldn't prevent all women from being engineers, for instance, right? If, if a man or a woman is gifted in that area, we should treat them as an individual and go about that. Which again, that gets you into ordination because look, we're talking about individuals who should be ordained. Um, so in that sense, it's quite important that, you know, we don't just bang too much on those sort of distinctions in, in a group level sense and use those group level distinctions to inform our individual decision about what women should be ordained. So that's sort of answering, I think, the objection here. Um, expressive individualism. Yeah, so that's a problem. I think it is. I think the the shift away from communal culture to individual culture has has you know sort of drawn with it many problems. Um, you know, I think you need a mix of both. But when you're looking at again, this this is the fundamental point I would make in response to all of the criticisms that this author of this article is bringing up is that when we're talking about ordination, we are talking about how is this individual suited for this role? Is he or she suited well? Is he or she suited, suited not well, right? So that's why the class-based argument doesn't have much purchase for me. Um, so, you know, this this sort of modern, you know, this, this critique that, you know, Will Witt is basically a modernist or, or advancing a modernist or post-modernist argument. I think that's important to note. Um, I wish he'd done less of that because of this reason that it's not convincing to like, look, you're talking, you know, you're drawing from these feminists, theologians, or, you know, you're these, these, these mod, these very modern arguments that are not in connection with, you know, but at the same time, I think what we respond is like, look, you're doing the same thing. I just laid out how your arguments against women's ordination are modern arguments. They're not traditional arguments. So I don't think that specific objection would hold much water there. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I think I'll leave it there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry if this video was very disjointed and and uh, sort of all over the place and probably too long too. But hey, I mean, you know, I wanted to lay these things out. I wanted to talk about these things and this book really helped me. I mean, I think the gist of what it would say is for me personally, I was concerned about can a woman administer the Eucharist? Is that proper? Is that is that proper for that to be the case? Can can she administer the sacraments? Is that is that something that only a male should do? And I think I would never say I'm one hundred percent confident on on these things like that because it's a difficult issue, and people throughout Christians throughout history have, on good faith, taken positions on both sides. So that's part of it, but at the same time. Um, I don't see a, a reason if if we think about what the role of the of the priest is in administering the sacraments, then I at least the way that Wit lays it out, if you if you agree with that, then I don't see any reason to preclude women from that. And I didn't I didn't go on to a ton of depth of how exactly he lays that out. But I think that the the primary point that helped me come to this conclusion is that. The priest is, 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 is primarily representing the church. Now, the priest is, is in, in the liturgy, the, 
the the head of the church. So in that sense, the priest also represents Christ. But the point is that the priest representing the church becomes before the priest representing Christ. And this is something that modern Catholic and Orthodox objections to the in persona Christi logic of older Catholic arguments we're talking about, basically. Um, yeah, and so I think that's convincing to me. And so, and also the, you know, the, the strange idea that the, the priest needs to bear a physical resemblance to Christ. And, you know, like, I mean, does, does that also mean that the priest should be a, you know, a first century Jew, of which we have none today, right? Um, you know, and you could say, well, that, that sort of then goes back to our point of like the fundamental bifurcation between male and female categories and whether that's, that is, whether that should be the fundamental bifurcation. I think there is a bifurcation. I think there is a, I think there is a spirit of the masculine that has certain attributes to it, you know, expansive, whatever, these sort of things we talked about. There's a spirit of the feminine that has, you know, maybe more receptive or whatever, um, and I'm not throwing those out. I don't want to throw those out. But I think those should be subsumed under the structure. The only reason that those spirits, those archetypes sort of exist is because male and female were created because they were created for each other. They are fundamentally relational. And that those archetypes of masculine and feminine only emerge out of the relational ontology that characterizes humanity not male or female, but human. And Christ is biologically male, of course, and that's important. But first and foremost, Christ is humanity. Christ represents humanity, not male or female. So anyways, I'll stop my rambling and leave it there. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> you can keep up with my disjointed thoughts. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and I will be back with more soon.